This sound killed reputations, this shape broke rivals, and this secret nearly destroyed Ferrari itself. You've been told it was a boxer, it wasn't. You've been told it was unbeatable. That lasted five years. What you weren't told is how one engine could be both a dynasty maker and an aerodynamics victim, sometimes in the same race. This is the shocking truth behind Ferrari's Typo 015 Flat 12, the motor that rewrote F1 glory and then erased itself. Birth of a revolution. The story doesn't start with dominance. It starts with chaos inside Maranello. In October 1961, Ferrari nearly tore itself apart during what became known as the Great Walkout. Senior engineers stormed out, furious with Enzo Ferrari's iron grip and family politics. The factory floor bled talent. For a moment, the empire looked fragile. Into that vacuum stepped Mauro Forghieri. 27 years old, no reputation, no victories. Yet Enzo handed him the keys to the kingdom, rebuild Ferrari's technical soul from scratch. Every car, every gearbox, every engine. Imagine that weight landing on your shoulders. Forghieri's answer was radical. A flat 12 stretched to 180 degrees, wider than a V, lower than a boxer. Why? Because dropping the center of gravity could change handling forever. And if Ferrari wanted to strike back at the Cosworth DFI, balance had to become a weapon. Here's the myth bust. The Typo 015 wasn't a boxer at all. A real boxer fires pistons like fists, punching in opposite directions. The 015's pistons shared crank pins, synchronized punches, not mirrored ones. In truth, it was a 180 V12. Ferrari's marketing team knew Berlinetta Boxer sounded sexier than Flat V, so the lie stuck. Mauro cut through the noise. This is not a boxer. It's a V engine laid flat. Still, the trick mattered. Push 12 cylinders wide and low, and you could drop the nose, sharpen steering, and give drivers a chassis they could lean on for hours. The first proof came in 1964 with the Ferrari 1512 F1 and its Tipo 207, a 1.5-liter shrieker that screamed to 12,000 RPM and spat out 220 horsepower. Rivals heard the banshee wail and winced, but torque fell off a cliff. On twisty circuits, drivers chased power that only lived at the red line. It was brilliance tangled with frustration. That tension between genius and compromise was the seed of the Tipo 015. Forghieri didn't abandon it. He hardened it. By 1975, the layout evolved into a three-liter beast, the heart of the 312T. The first Tipo 207 back in 1964 had already screamed to 12,000 RPM and produced 220 horsepower, proof of brilliance tangled with flaws. And in that shift, Ferrari's revolution finally arrived, a beginning forged in doubt, shaken by politics, carried by one young engineer, and destined to redraw the map of Formula One. Engineering marvel or Trojan horse? On paper, the Tipo 015 looked like Ferrari's masterstroke, 12 cylinders spread in a perfect 180-degree fan, an engine so wide it practically scraped the floor. To engineers, it promised stability. To drivers, it promised trust. But the devil hid in one word. Boxer. Say that, and you imagine opposing fists punching in balance, natural harmony at every stroke. The 015 wasn't that. Its pistons fired in synchronized pairs, off the same crank pin. Less boxer, more flattened V12. The marketing department sold the romance. The crankshaft told the truth. Yes, the layout lowered the center of gravity. Yes, it made the car squat mid-corner instead of rolling wide, but it also created nightmares under the bodywork. The block sprawled so far across the chassis that Ferrari's aero team was forced to bend airflow around it. In the mid-70s, when downforce came from wings bolted on like afterthoughts, the compromise stayed hidden. When ground effect arrived, the curse revealed itself. Heat became the next enemy. Twelve cylinders laid flat meant more plumbing, more coolant, more oil-fighting gravity and distance. The engine bay cooked itself. Mechanics in Marinello called it a rolling furnace, capable of carrying Lauda or Schecter to glory if the temps stayed in check, but merciless if they drifted into the red. Then came vibration. A true boxer cancels itself out. The 180-degree V12 didn't. Secondary harmonics shook through the chassis, rattling bearings, frothing oil, shocking gearboxes. Not enough to break on lap one, but enough to turn every finish into a stress test. And yet, the architecture bit hard. That flat sprawl gave Forgieri room to slide in a transverse gearbox, tucked behind the motor but ahead of the axle line. A radical choice. It shoved mass forward, shortened the drivetrain, and tightened the car's rotation. Rivals cursed it as a knife in corners, slicing in where their cars lumbered. Forgieri framed it simply. Lower. Lighter. Cleaner. 
It wasn't about the biggest dino number, it was about control. Ferrari built a package that bled time from the stopwatch, lap after lap. The flat 12 in its mature form produced more than 500 horsepower from a 180-degree V12, naturally aspirated, paired with a transverse five-speed gearbox. To some, it was a marvel. To others, a Trojan horse, a design that carried the seed of its own destruction, even as it carved Ferrari's sharpest blade of the decade. Early failures and humiliation. Ferrari didn't unleash the Tipo 015 straight into glory. It had to stumble before it could sprint. The first trial came in 1964, when the 1.5 liter flat 12, coded Tipo 207, was bolted into the Ferrari 1512 F1. On the dyno, it looked like a miracle. 12,000 RPM, 220 horsepower, a scream higher than anything else in the pit lane. Drivers said it howled like a banshee, a pitch that made veterans wince. But dyno sheets don't hand out trophies. On track, the weakness was brutal. Torque delivery fell off a cliff. Below the razor edge of the rev band, power vanished. At tight circuits, John Surtees fought a car that only came alive at the edge of mechanical sanity. Miss a gear by half a heartbeat, and momentum collapsed. Twelve cylinders turned into twelve anchors. Rivals noticed. At Spa in June 1964, the Ferrari thundered down the straits, its note echoing across the Ardennes. But through La Source and Malmedy, it bogged. In the paddock, Cosworth and BRM crews mocked it. Ferrari built a concert hall, not a race car. Then came fragility. At Monza, September 1964, heat overwhelmed the motor, bearings scuffed. Mechanics tore down the block and found shimmering flakes of metal in the sump, evidence of a cooling system losing its war. Forghieri admitted later the truth. The first flat V12 was a laboratory more than a weapon. Every failure carried a cost. Sponsors grew nervous. Journalists sharpened their knives. Ferrari's dominance of the early 1960s felt like ancient history. Whispers spread. Maybe the flat V12 was a dead end. And yet, humiliation can forge resolve. Surtees cut through the noise after another limp weekend. It's fast, but it doesn't fight. Brutal honesty. But it forced Ferrari to listen. If the flat V12 was to survive, it had to evolve. Grow displacement change balance, and stop being a dino queen. In 1964, the early Tipo 207 screamed to 12,000 ERPM and produced 220 horsepower, but it frequently suffered reliability issues, overheating, bearing wear, and cooling failures that left Ferrari frustrated. The early flat V12 embarrassed Ferrari, but hidden in that embarrassment was the kernel of a dynasty that would later dominate Formula One. Revenge on track. The humiliation of the 1960s didn't kill the flat V12. It sharpened it into a blade. By 1970, Ferrari returned with the 312B, a 3-liter flat V12, built to match Formula One's new displacement rules. It sang at 11,500 RPM and punched out 455 horsepower. Finally, Ferrari had something that looked like a weapon, but the real revolution waited five years. Enter the 312T. The T stood for transversale. The transverse gearbox, Mauro Forghieri, bolted across the back of the Tipo 015. This wasn't a gimmick. By spinning the gearbox sideways instead of lengthwise, Ferrari shoved mass forward, chopped the polar moment of inertia, and made the car pivot like a knife. In Niki Lauda's words, it was a car that did exactly what I told it. 1975 proved it. Lauda won five of the first nine races, and by September, at Monza, he clinched the driver's crown while Ferrari secured the constructor's title. The engine that once embarrassed the Scuderia had transformed into the heartbeat of a dynasty, delivering around 495 horsepower at 12,200 RPM in the 312T. The march didn't stop. In 1976, the 312T2 carried Lauda to another championship fight until his fiery Nürburgring crash nearly ended his life. He returned scarred but unbroken. By 1977, he reclaimed the driver's crown. Two years later, Jody Schechter added another title with the 312T4. Across its lifespan, the 312T family delivered 27 Grand Prix victories, four constructors' championships, and three driver's crowns. Against the omnipresent Cosworth DFI, which powered nearly every other car on the grid, Ferrari's Tipo 015 stood almost alone as a heretic layout, and it beat them. But this was never just about numbers. It was about trust. The Tipo 015 might run hot, but it rarely quit. Mechanics in the paddock nicknamed it 
the cast iron monster, a furnace that burned through 300 kilometers and still had strength left, while rivals scattered engines across gravel traps, Ferrari's cars crossed the line. In an era where attrition was half the battle, that reliability was deadlier than another 10 horsepower. Lauda put it simpler than any statistic could. The car was honest. If you respected it, it respected you back. That honesty, paired with Ferrari's relentless refinement, made the Tipo 015 the most feared sound of the mid-70s, a howl that meant victory or surrender. Over average race distances of nearly 300 kilometers, the 312T family delivered consistency as well as speed, stacking up 27 Grand Prix victories. The revenge was complete. From the ashes of early humiliation, Ferrari had built not just a fast engine, but a dynasty maker. The ground effect war. Dynasties rarely collapse because they slow down. They collapse because the rules of the game change. For Ferrari's Tipo 015, that shift hit in the late 1970s with one word, ground effect. In 1978, Colin Chapman rolled out the Lotus 79, and it looked alien. Instead of bolting on wings, Chapman carved speed from the air itself. Venturi tunnels under the chassis accelerated airflow, sucking the car into the tarmac. The effect was savage. Massive downforce, almost no drag. Corners that once terrified drivers turned into flat-out straights. Ferrari had a problem. The 015's greatest strength, its wide, low spread, became a wall. The flat V12 stretched so broad across the bay that there was no room for the deep tunnels Lotus exploited. Engineers at Marinello carved and sculpted side pods around the block, but physics didn't negotiate. A narrow V could breathe through tunnels. A flat V12 could not. By 1979, even as the 312 T4's flat V12 produced around 515 horsepower at 12,500 RPM, the car was crippled by a catastrophic downforce deficit. And it wasn't just aero. Ground effect cars needed stiff chassis, compact packaging, and clean airflow to keep the ground seal. Ferrari's wide body forced compromise everywhere. Cooling, suspension geometry, even weight distribution. Rivals sneered in the paddock, calling the 015 a plank across the tunnels. They weren't wrong. By 1980, the 312 T5 was a shadow of its championship ancestors. The same engine that had powered Lauda and Schecter to titles now sat in a car that refused to turn. Gilles Villeneuve fought it beyond reason, wringing out performances that hid how hopeless the chassis had become. Jody Schecter, reigning world champion, didn't score a single podium. Ferrari limped to 10th in the constructor's standings, often more than two seconds per lap slower than Lotus. It was the cruel irony of racing. The 015 hadn't lost its horsepower. It hadn't lost its reliability. It had lost its relevance. One aerodynamic revolution had turned a champion's weapon into dead weight. Colin Chapman hadn't just built a faster car. He had exposed Ferrari's flat V12 as a dead end. The same width that once carved a dynasty now strangled it. From track to street. The Tipo 015 didn't only fight its wars on the racetrack, it spilled into Ferrari's road cars, reshaping what a flagship Ferrari looked like, sounded like, and felt like. In 1973, Ferrari retired the front-engine Daytona and unveiled the 365 GT4 BB. The BB meant Berlinetta Boxer, a myth more than a mechanic's truth. Still, it mattered. This was Ferrari's first mid-engined 12-cylinder road car. Beneath its skin sat a shrieking 4.4-liter flat V12, rated at 360 horsepower. Buyers, if you could call Ferrari's clients ordinary, were now sitting just inches ahead of an engine born on the Grand Prix grid. By 1976, the 512 BB replaced it. Displacement climbed to 4.9 liters, tuned for smoother torque. Power dipped on paper to about 355 to 360 horsepower. But the car was calmer, more livable on the Autostrada. This wasn't about numbers. It was about turning Ferrari's flat V12 into something an owner could actually endure in traffic. If endure is a word you can apply to a 12-cylinder banshee. Then came regulation. By 1981, emissions laws forced Marinello's hand. Out went carburetors. In came fuel injection. The 512 BBI kept roughly 335 to 340 horsepower, a compromise to purists, but survival to regulators. And then came the bombshell. 1984. The Testarossa. Side strakes as sharp as Miami Vice. A silhouette that screamed excess. And under its deck, 
The same flat V12 now breathing through four valves per cylinder. Output leapt to about 385 to 390 horsepower. Overnight, Ferrari wasn't just selling cars. It was selling posters, plastered on bedroom walls from Tokyo to Los Angeles. The 1990s brought refinement. The 512TR dropped the engine 30 millimeters lower in the chassis, cleaned the aero, sharpened ergonomics, and raised output to 4 122 horsepower. It wasn't revolution, it was evolution. Proof that Ferrari still believed in the flat V12 long after Formula One had walked away. Finally, in 1994, came the F512M, the modificato. Sleeker, harder, louder, the last of the bloodline, and the strongest at 434 horsepower. These weren't just Ferraris, they were rolling billboards for the Tipo 015's DNA. Wide, low, unforgiving. And when the last F512M rolled out of Marinello in 1996, it didn't just end a model. It closed the book on a bloodline that once humiliated rivals on track and defined Ferrari's road presence for two decades. Domination and decline. Every empire faces its sunset. For the Tipo 015, that sunset came not through weakness, but through a new arms race. By 1981, Formula One's rulebook had opened the door for 1.5-liter turbocharged engines, and Renault had already lit the fuse. Ferrari's flat V12 could still punch out over 500 horsepower in race trim, with reliability to match. But turbos were climbing past 600, then 700, then 800 horsepower in qualifying. The numbers weren't just bigger, they were decisive. On a straight, a turbo car devoured ground a naturally aspirated flat V12 could never reclaim. More than power, the turbo shape fit the new aerodynamic battlefield. Compact V6 blocks left space for wide Venturi tunnels, intercoolers, and massive radiators. The Tipo 015, broad as a table, had nowhere to hide. Ground effect had already exposed its girth. Turbocharging buried it. By 1980, the 312 T5's flat V12 still produced around 515 horsepower, but the first generation of turbos, arriving in 1981, were already pushing 550 to 600. Ferrari had no choice but to pivot. The 312 T5 closed the Tipo 015 chapter in disgrace, tenth in the constructor's standings, with Gilles Villeneuve wringing life from a chassis that refused to cooperate. By the next season, the team abandoned the flat V12 altogether, rolling out the Tipo 126C with a 1.5-liter twin-turbo V6. From 1975 to 1979, the Tipo 015 defined dominance. Three driver's titles, four constructor's championships, 27 Grand Prix victories. By 1980, it was obsolete. Formula One doesn't mourn. It moves on. The decline wasn't a collapse of power or durability. It was the realization that the flat V12, once Ferrari's sharpest blade, had been cornered by physics and regulation. The same design that made Ferrari invincible in one decade made them irrelevant in the next. Resurrection, legacy, and what if. The Tipo 015 never died on track. It was reborn in memory. It migrated into museums, into auction houses, where the bark of 12 flat cylinders still commands millions. Surviving 312T chassis today fetch over $7 million, rolling reminders of when Ferrari wrote dynasties with pistons, not pixels. At historic races, the shriek of the flat V12 still slices through the air, raw mechanical violence echoing across decades. Collectors call it bulletproof, not because it never broke, but because it survived an era when chaos was the norm. The design proved that balance could beat brute force, even if only for a narrow window in time. That window closed in 1980, but the legend never did. The Tipo 015 endures as the sound of Ferrari at its fiercest. And then the haunting thought, what if, what if Forgieri's flat V12 had been narrower? What if Ferrari had carved tunnels beneath it, bent physics to their will? Could the dynasty have survived the ground effect war, maybe even faced the turbo age on equal footing? Brilliance can dominate, until the rules rewrite the script. The Tipo 015 was Ferrari's masterpiece, and its undoing. Every sound, every failure, every victory hides a truth the history books don't tell. If you want more engines that changed Formula One forever, subscribe and keep chasing the stories beneath the noise.